Okay, so I'd, I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, the organisers for uh, allowing me to, to speak today about work on um, the potato and tomato genomes. Um, obviously, uh, as you'll know, the, uh, the potato genome um, was published last, uh, last July in Nature, so we're obviously all very, very pleased about that. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, despite my, uh, despite my uh, title, I'm actually not going to say that much about the, the tomato genome. Um, this is, so this is actually the only, only slide that's, uh, that deals with, with tomato. Um, the, t the tomato genome's in great shape. Uh, we've got a really good um, assembly. This figure here just shows um, the assembly for chromosome four. So this is this is it over here. This is this is actually the subject of the, the UK um, grant application that that uh, these guys here were involved in, and, and funded by BBSRC, Defra, and the, the Scottish government. Um, the target of our grant was to actually sequence um, sequence chromosome four. Um, so actually, chromosome four is in very good shape. It's only in sort of six six fragments. Uh, there's five gaps, so it's a, a really nice assembly. And the other chromosomes are. Of, of similar quality. So um, one thing I would say is if you want to know more um, about the, the tomato genome, please um, see Graham Seymour, who's in the audience, and he, he can uh, fill you in on what the latest situation is. And also I'd advise you to, um, well, to look at the poster by Natalie Chapman, which shows um, some really nice work on how um, the tomato genome sequence is being used um, in an attempt to find genes underlying um, a fruit texture, QTL. So, right, so now I'm going to spend the rest of my time um, talking about potato. Uh, so what I'm really going to do is actually say, say a bit about how, um, how the potato genome was sequenced. And then at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we're actually using the potato genome sequence at the James Hutton Institute <coughs> to, uh, to go after genes underlying um, traits. So potato is quite um, you know, a very interesting crop, <coughs> uh, the most important non-cereal uh, food crop around the world, and it's becoming of increasing um, global importance. Has this kind of unique biology? Um, it produces um, tubers on, on underground stems called called stolons. Um, it's an important tree diet, important dietary source of, uh, of, of of lots of lots of things. It's very adaptable. It grows in a very wide range of habitats and um, around the world. We have a huge. Uh, genetic resource for potato. There, are, there, are, uh, there were, at one point, over 200 described uh, tuber-bearing uh, species of potato. Um, and so uh, we have this huge, uh, diverse genetic resource that we, that we can use in, in, in genetics and in, and in breeding. Um, the downside of cultivated potato is that it's a, it's a highly heterozygous uh, autotetraploid species, which makes, makes genetics quite difficult. So. Um, so if you imagine a typical cultivar, this is just a sort of cartoon showing a few, you know, five genes, and uh, the, the different shades kind of represent different alleles. And you can imagine that, uh, you know, every, every tetrapoid cultivar has, uh, I, think, I think it's estimated that uh, an average cultivar has something like uh, an average of over three alleles of every gene. So, um, so it's actually, you know, it's a huge amount of actual diversity is locked up in, in one, within one genotype. And if you cross two... Uh, tetraploid cultivars together, that releases a huge amount of variation and you get a huge number of genotypes, which is all well and good, but it actually makes genetics quite difficult. So what we do to get around that is we tend to work mostly at the diploid level, um, using um, a bit like some of the stuff that Ian just talked about, using heterozygous um, parents, uh, diploid heterozygotes. Um, and then we either use things called dihaploids, which are diploids actually made directly from, from tetraploids using parthenogenesis, or we use diploid wild species or, or land races, um, especially for things like disease resistance, where we, we, we use a lot of um, the wild species I mentioned. You can also make these things called, called monoploids, which are, uh, which are true haploids, which uh, aren't particularly viable, but uh, you can actually make these from, from diploids. So then you just have a single, single haplotype. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a bit in a little bit when I actually talk more about the genome sequence. Um, I mean, one of the, the, the kind of downside of always working with heterozygous parents is most of the traits we work on look like this when we look at a, a distribution of the phenotypes. You know, we don't see, um, we really see very little discontinuous uh, trait variation except for a few traits such as disease resistance. So nearly all of the, especially the quality traits that we work on, um, they're, they're quantitative, uh, complex, and always show this kind of continuous uh, distribution. So the, the Potato Genome Consortium um, is, is most of the, the main players are pictured here. This is actually at a meeting that we had in June um, 2009 in Ireland. And, and at this meeting, we made a, a quite a big um, decision to really change the way we were doing things within the potato genome. So this was sort of about 
four years into the um, when first on work on the potato genome first first started, and uh, we, as I said at this this meeting, we decided to to kind of make a radical change in the way um, we were doing things. The 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 potato genome is really a a, a tale of, of two genotypes. Um, this one here, RH, which is the one we we started working on at the beginning. So this is a heterozygous uh, diploid Dutch. Uh, breeding line. Uh, it's also the male parent of the ultra high density genetic map that uh, we produced um, uh, several years ago as part of an EU project. So this was actually selected because it was the least heterozygous parent of that cross, but it's still a really, really, really heterozygous individual. And this is the, the DM, the one that we actually eventually sequenced. So this is a, um, a doubled monoploid. So it's like a monoploid that I talked about a minute ago, but it's actually been doubled with colchicine to make it diploid. Um, it's completely homozygous. Um, and and it's, uh, it, this, this one in particular is um, from the, uh, the subspecies or um, cultivar group, Solanum tuberosum, uh, group for echo. So it's, uh, it's, st it's still a, a cultivated potato and extremely closely related to uh, normal Solanum tuberosum. So um, the first, uh, when we first started this project uh, several years ago, we, we had this kind of chromosome, country by chromosome kind of approach. Um, where different countries opted for different chromosomes. And, and the idea was to use um, the physical map of RH, which was in kind of reasonable, reasonable shape, uh, to actually identify tiling paths across the, the different chromosomes. Uh, the UK and Ireland teamed up to, to do chromosome four. But around about um, the middle of 2008, we realized that this really wasn't working. Um, we had sort of 15 countries involved, and there seemed to be 15 different ways of doing it. Um, nobody could really agree on a, on a strategy for finishing off any, any chromosomes. Some countries had just started. Uh, the, the Netherlands, for example, had almost finished chromosome five uh, before we even got our money uh, to, to do the work. And it was causing a lot of problems. And, and, and actually, the biggest problem was this um, heterozygosity of RH, which, which made life very difficult. And in 2008, we discussed the possibility of using um, a, do, a, a homozygous genotype and, and you know, the next generation sequencing methods were getting much, much cheaper then and, uh, and tractable. So we thought this was, was, a, was an option for us. And this, this slide here kind of illustrates the problem that uh, RH, uh, being, being highly heterozygous, has, you know, has two haplotypes. You've basically got two, two very uh, divergent genomes in, in, in there. So uh, this is a big problem for making a physical map and it's a big problem for sequencing. Whereas the, the double monoploid just had one, a single, single haplotype, and so that would, would make things a lot easier. But the thing to point out is we hadn't done any kind of genetics in the past on DM, so there was no physical or genetic map available for DM, so everything we did was being done kind of de novo. Um, this is just some pictures of the, the double monoploid uh, in, in tissue culture and, and, and other stuff. So, so, so at the meeting in, in Carlo, we decided to make a whole genome um, shotgun of DM, uh, mostly using Illumina technology, and, uh, but also um, quite a lot of uh, 454 um, data, you know, paired end data and stuff like that, and also some um, uh, back-end and FOSMID end sequencing for long-range scaffolding. Uh, we also decided to generate a large uh, transcriptome resource, uh, 45 libraries altogether, um, to, to mainly to assist the annotation process. And also we established a mapping team to actually genetically anchor the assembly um, you know, to the 12 chromosomes. So um, the transcriptome sequencing, um, this data was actually, uh, I won't really say much about this. Um, if anybody's interested in getting this data, it's actually available. Um, there were 45 libraries altogether, um, 16 from RH and 29 for DM, uh, lots of different tissues and um, stages of development and treatments. And uh, the, the main reason for, for generating this, as I said, was for, for annotation. Um, there is actually a paper on this by Alicia Massa in, in PLOS One last year. And one example of, of, from sort of looking at this data, if you, um, obviously uh, starch biosynthesis is very important in, in uh, tuber yield, and we see quite big differences in expression of um, biosynthetic genes um, for producing starch. So RH is actually a breeding line, and it's been selected for, for yield, and we see much higher um, expression levels of some of the, um, these biosynthetic genes in tubers of RH. And, and um, conversely, in the DM, we actually see um, higher expression of amylases in, in tubers, which obviously break down, break down starch. So, um, so when, you, when you do a genome assembly, um, obviously, uh, I don't really have time to go into it here, but um, there, there are sort of two really uh, big, big stages. One is the assembly, uh, which is the, the pipeline for that is on the left here. 
Um, and then there's obviously annotation. That's uh, finding all the, the gene models in the genome. That's on, on the right. And uh, I'm not really going to say very much uh, about these two things. It's all in the, in the publication. Um, just, I'm just going to summarize by saying we generated over 120-fold genome coverage with Illumina, um, a lot of 454 data, and as I said, the, the back ends. Um, and and the, the net result of all this is that the, um, more than 90% of the genome is represented by 440 um, super scaffolds, the minimum size of which is about 350 KB. And the annotation pipeline identified um, 39,000 um, gene models. And uh, I think it's something like 88 percent of these gene models had um, support either from the RNA-seq data or from, from protein databases. So this is a very high, high rate. Um, I mentioned the, the anchoring process before. This was, this was something that uh, my group was really, really heavily involved in. So um, a new uh, genetic, um, a, a new population was developed by SIP in Lima in Peru. Um, involving the DM, so this is a cross to a, to a heterozygous uh, genotype, and then, uh, and then that was a back cross back to the, back to the heterozygo. Um, so this was part of the um, way we did the anchoring. We also used bioinformatic approaches, um, comparisons to the, um, the tomato genome, and also comparisons to the RH um, physical map. So it was a, a quite a complicated process to actually anchor um, the genome to the 12, um, to, to make these 12 pseudomolecules. Um, so now we think we're in a position where we've got something like 95% of the genes are mapped to an accurate um, location. A, a quite an important part of this actually was to um, identify chimeric scaffolds in the assembly. So um, I think the number is actually closer to 200 now. So obviously using the mapping information, we were able to identify uh, super scaffolds which belonged on two different chromosomes or two different places on the same, same chromosome. And, uh, we, we fixed a large, large number of those by this process. Um, on, the, on the top right there, there's a figure um, using a, a new program called um, DMAP, written by David, David Martin at the University of Dundee. And uh, it's just a, a way of sort of representing the genetic map and the, the physical map. And then um, down below is a, is a shot from um, a tool that uh, one of the infamous, oh, it's been cut off at the bottom. Um, there's a, um, it's a pseudomolecule of chromosome three. Um, I'm using a tool, um, developed by a guy called Dan Bolter, also at the University of Dundee, for actually visualizing the pseudomolecule of a, of a chromosome. And you can actually use this tool to actually look at, um, look at the raw data to actually inspect it and, and, and kind of um, you know, move things around if you think things are in the wrong place. So this has actually been quite a, uh, this sort of manual, semi-manual creation has actually been a really important process in establishing um, version three of the pseudomolecules. And a, and a paper is actually being produced on this, this right now. Um, so then um, having these, these pseudomolecules allowed us to, to draw one of these CIRCOS um, diagrams of the genome. This is actually based on um, version one of the pseudomolecules. So actually, we're, again, we're going to make a more updated figure of this for, for another paper that should come out soon. And um, what, it, what it shows, though, um, even though the, the pseudomolecules weren't perfect at this stage, is that the genes, that's these dark, dark bits here, are actually located towards the ends of the chromosomes. Chromosomes two is different because the centromere is at, at the end. Um, the repeats are actually clustered towards the centromeres on most, most of the chromosomes. We also evidence, see evidence of hotspots of, of gene expression. And then also, um, we have significant um, evidence for uh, genome uh, duplication has been, as it has been seen with many other um, sequence uh, dicot genomes. So, um, so what about using the genome? So um, this is... This is uh, something that's really, really important to us because we do a lot of genetics at the James Hutton Institute and, and also lots of other people around the world. And we're sort of looking at now how we can, can, can use the, the genome in our, in our research, or, which is obviously a, a rationale for doing it in the first place. Um, so one of the things uh, we've been involved in developing is sort of new tools for um, you know, doing things like measuring gene expression and, and mapping. So one of these um, is a new, a new version of the Agilent microarray that we used before. And this, this uses the newer um, 8x55K um, format that Agilent have introduced and um, actually contains all of the potato genes in the genome. So actually all of the, the genes are, are on there as well as many of the different isoforms um, predict, predicted um, from the sequence. Um, some people might say, uh, why aren't we going over to doing um, next gen you know, RNA-seq or something like this? We, st we still think there's a lot of value in using a microarray. Um, analysis is a lot more straightforward for us. And also, if we want to do any kind of quantification, um, we still think that this, this microarray has a lot, um, a lot to offer. 
Um, and for, for mapping, um, the USDA, a USDA project in, uh, in the US has developed this um, Illumina um, Infinium uh, Golden Gate, uh, Infinium, sorry, not Golden Gate, Infinium um, SNP platform. Um, we, we actually have developed some Golden Gate um, SNP arrays as well in, in, in James Hutton Institute, but we've gone over to using this, uh, this 10K platform because it's actually much more, um, I think the, it probably costs about twice as much to run um, 8,300 SNPs as it, as it costs to run about 1,000 um, in our own lab, so it's actually much more cost effective to use this new, new platform. Um, it gives really, in, in potato, in um, you know, crosses between outbred parents, it gives really nice uh, genotypic information, actually allows us to identify um, genotypes in both in diploid and tetraploid crosses, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice um, resource. So we've actually, um, and, and another, another nice thing is that all, all of the SNPs um, on this array you can directly see in the, the genome browser. So you can, you know, once you've made a map, um, you can actually go straight to the genome browser and see um, what genome scaffolds these, these markers um, are on. So, so the crosses that we, the crosses and um, association mapping platform uh, population we've looked at, we found more than 4,000 um, polymorphic markers in, in, the, in the two crosses. We're still analyzing um, the data from a, a large association mapping uh, population. Um, one, of the, one of the outputs of this is that um, Christine Hackett, who works for, um, for BIOS, has developed, is, is, has an, and is still developing um, completely new software for doing mapping in tetraploids and, and for doing, doing QTL analysis. And again, a paper should be coming out on that um, soon. So, um, so now I'm just going to just lastly talk about a couple of, uh, a couple of other ways that we're using um, the genome sequence. So at the James Hutton Institute, one of the traits that we're really interested in is, um, is, is drought resistance in potato and water use efficiency. So um, one of my colleagues, um, Ankush Prashar, has been using um, infrared thermography as a way of uh, measuring um, or estimating stomatal uh, conductance, conductance, which we... Um, I think has an important role to play in sort of water relations in, in potato. And uh, he's done a lot of, over the last two or three years, he's done a lot of um, field-based measurements of some, of some of the populations. This, this picture up on the left shows, shows one of the, uh, the populations out in the field near Dundee. And quite surprisingly to me, um, at, at first, if you go to the, uh, do these measurements in the field, um, at different, um, these different colored spots here at different time points in the season, and then you rank the plants in the population from, from low to high, you actually see pretty repeatable uh, measurements. So actually the, the data actually looks pretty good. And uh, so doing this, um, uh, he, he's been, Ankush has been able to map a, um, quite a large effect uh, QTL on chromosome 2. And uh, um, by using the markers most uh, closely associated um, with this, you can go straight into the genome and he finds quite a nice, uh, uh, in, in, this, in the, one of the scaffolds that these markers um, actually hit, he finds this nice ABA um, stress-inducible protein, I think it's called TAS-14. TAS so, you know, we're not 100% sure this is a gene for this QTL. It gives us a good, good starting point and a nice candidate gene to start, to, to start looking at. Um, similarly, um, we, we do, we're doing quite a lot of work now on um, tuber dormancy break and sprouting in, in potato. So this is actually a really... Um, commercially important trait in potato, um, and all previous uh, publications on, on this trait have shown it to be genetically uh, quite complicated. Some papers have reported up to nine, nine QTLs. It's thought to be hormonally um, regulated, and in, a, in, in two of our populations, we've actually been able to find a fairly large um, effect QTL, explaining up to sort of 20, nearly 25 percent of the, the phenotypic variation on, on chromosome three, and um, so but again, by, by taking the SNPs um, you know, that, that, that map right underneath this QTL, we can go into a couple of the genome scaffolds in the region. And there are actually uh, a couple of really nice um, kind, of, uh, of it, kind of candidate genes that we might have predicted um, possibly from, from what we know about um, hormone signaling. And so again, this gives us a really nice lead, I think, to actually identifying um, the gene for this, for this QTL. So the last thing I want to talk about is... Um, Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is, is resistance genes in potato. Uh, we, we've spent a huge amount of time over the last uh, several years, um, as have most other potato geneticists, uh, mapping um, resistance genes 
to, to various um, pests and diseases of potato. And uh, as, as you saw from the talk by uh, Sir John Bennington yesterday, uh, potato probably suffers more from diseases than uh, just about any other crop. Um, all, all resistance genes, uh, almost all resistance genes that have been isolated from potato are these um, nucleotide binding site, leucine rich repeat um, type genes. So one of the things um, we decided to do was actually use, use the genome to actually find um, the location of all of the MB LRRs in the genome so that we had a really nice kind of handle, on, if you like, on where all these, these genes were. Um, one of the things that I'm not talking about today is actually in collaboration with um, Jonathan Jones's lab here in Norwich, um, we've developed a, a capture array for actually um, using on, on bulks from populations uh, segregating for resistance to actually try to uh, make the, the isolation of these genes um, more, you know, more efficient. So, um, so basically, uh, a guy called Florian Dupe, uh, in, in collaboration with some of the informaticists, uh, a, a student in our lab who um, also works, uh, is a student who works between um, JHI and, and the, uh, the Sainsbury lab, uh, did an analysis using um, various informatic tools and predicted uh, 438 um, MB LRRs in potato. And um, this, is, this was actually just published a week or two ago in BMC Genomics. And, the, if, you, if you look at it on the, on the, if you look at the data as plotted on the 12 um, potato um, pseudomolecules, you can see, as, as expected from, from other work, there's a lot of, a lot of clustering of, of the genes. So that there are basically two, two classes of, um, of MBLRs. There's the, the coiled coil type, which actually really do show um, a lot of clustering. So you can see these big clusters and, uh, on places like chromosome 4 and, and 5 and um, uh, nine and uh, top and bottom of 11. And, and actually these, these big clusters all um, uh, map to places where, where a lot of actual functional resistances have been mapped. So they, if you were going to predict where the big clusters would be, these are, these are all the locations. What is really interesting is that the, uh, the TIR type of uh, resistance gene uh, don't show any, anything like the same level of physical um, clustering in the genome. And if you, if you actually look at these genes phylogenetically, um, you see that for the, um, for the, the coiled coil genes, the, the clustering, um, the physical clustering follows the, the phylogenetic clustering um, you know, very, very closely. So, so genes which are clustered phylogenetically are actually tend to be physically, physically clustered as well. Um, but conversely, the, the, the TILs or the, the TNLs as they're sometimes called, they, they cluster very closely phylogenetically, but they don't actually cluster um, physically in the genome. So again, I think this information is going to be really useful for us in, in cloning resistance genes in the future. So, so just to sum up, um, we, um, we, we now know the, the sequences and the map locations of more than 95% of potato genes. Well, we've developed uh, some, some nice new, new tools for doing genetics and gene expression studies. And, and, and the, the maps that we've made actually link very, very well to all the um, previous potato maps and the tomato genome and, and, and things like that. I think a, a key thing really to move forward, though, um, is we need much better genetic and, and functional tools. Uh, it, it's all very well having all the genes, but actually working out what they do is, is, is quite difficult. So I think, um, and I think there, there's a need to sort of kind of if possible, we need to kind of mendelize potato to some extent um, to actually try and um, generate some variation that isn't um, continuous. So this is something we just don't have in potato. So one thing um, I've been doing recently is to uh, use an inbred species of potato to actually generate um, mutate, EMS mutated um, populations, just small ones at the moment, but the plan is to, to scale this up at some time. So we can actually and this is a, a tuberizing species, so we can actually generate mutants. So I think this is a, possibly a way, a way forward. Um, and, and we can use this same inbred species of potato. I think we can actually also use um, this inbred species of potato to make um, intragression lines in the same way that the, the Zamir um, intragression lines work so well in, in tomato. Um, going back to sequencing, I think it's important um, if you're working on a, a highly... Um, heterozygous organisms, so, so again, some of the things that Ian just mentioned in his talk, if you're going to sequence it, um, if there's any way by sort of hook or by crook you can make a homozygote, then I would say do it because it's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, but people who work on potato, I mean, heterozygosity is a fact of life. All, all the other material we'll probably ever work with uh, will be heterozygous. And so 
Um, we're now very interested in doing um, either genotyping by sequencing or doing um, resequencing of different species or different varieties. And uh, I think we have a major, a major challenge ahead of us to, to do that. And I think um, um, the, the new technology coming in from Illumina with a longer read should be really helpful in that. So I'd just like to finish by acknowledging a few people, um, the, the funding agencies that have funded most of our work, um, some of my colleagues at the, the James Hutton Institute, um, the guys at University of Dundee that did a lot of the informatics on the, on the genome project, um, Jonathan Jones and, and his lab for work on the resistance genes, uh, Chris Hackett at BIOS is doing a lot of the, uh, the quantitative genetics with us, and uh, uh, um, obviously for fellow members of the Potato Genome Consortium and the, um, the SOLCAP project, the USDA funded SOLCAP project for sharing um, unpublished data. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Richard Summers. Um, I really enjoyed your talk and one of the things that interests me with this is, is your ability now to transfer some of this genomic understanding into the commercial breeding community. I mean, obviously that what interests me in the cereal community. I, I wondered how uh, that's happening and, and if you've got any uh, 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 models that would be useful for us. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's a question we're a bit, but the, the, we actually have uh, breeding programs at James Hutton Institute that are commercially funded and of course the guys from the companies are asking the same, same questions. Uh, I mean, it's very clear to me how we can use the knowledge now for genetics. I mean, you know, the, the data's all there, we can map things and now go straight into the genome. I think for breeding, um, I think uh, uh, it's going to take a bit longer, I think. But I think we really need to work out, you know, how. I mean, I think it certainly, in a sort of simplistic way, I think finding, um, finding markers that are diagnostic for, for important traits to the, to the companies and the breeders, it's going to be a lot easier now because once we've got a SNP marker, we can go into the genome and we can, we can actually go into that scaffold and pick out, you know, that's what something we're doing at the moment, picking out, you know, five markers or something and then running them all on a panel of material and coming up with maybe three or four markers which are diagnostic for that trait and then that can be used in, in breeding. Um, but I think realistically, I mean, I think probably the, the most important way forward is, is going to be GM. I mean, I think we, down the line, I think being able to use GM in, in breeding and, you know, being able to identify the genes and actually deploy them, uh, you know, by transgenics is, is the way forward. But obviously there are a lot of issues around that at the moment, so.